Hey guys, welcome back to RPO Restorations. Today, I decided to talk about one of my favorite things to tune and fix in the GM world. This item has been a source of frustration for home and professional mechanics alike since its introduction almost 45 years ago. This is, however, an item that could give smooth and relatively trouble-free performance when it was actually tuned correctly. It was produced for nine years until it was finally phased out in favor of electronic fuel injection. This item is the Rochester Electronic Carburetor. Debuting for the 1980 model year in California and 1981 in the rest of the United States, the feedback or electronic carburetor as it was more commonly known was essentially a modification of what GM already had in production. They incorporated two new pieces of technology into the carburetor itself a mixture control solenoid to control the primary mirroring rods and a throttle position sensor to let the engine computer know what the throttle angle was. They operated in conjunction with GM's new computer command control system, which was GM's version of the OBD1 engine computer. They came in three different versions depending on the engine they were being used on. The two barrel Verajet for use on four cylinder engines, the two barrel dual jet which was essentially the front half of a quadrajet and the four barrel quadrajet. They also came in both electric and hot air choke configurations. Carburetors were given a different letter designation depending on what they were. For instance, the electronic quadrajet with an electric choke was given the designation E4ME instead of M4ME with the E standing for electronic. With the exception of the mixture control solenoid controlling the primary metering rods, all other aspects of the carburetor were essentially the same as their mechanical siblings. The choke, float, and vacuum brakes all function as they would on the previous versions. This would also include the secondary side of the four barrel quadrajet. The electronic feedback carburetor's primary purpose was to help control tailpipe emissions. As built, there really wasn't a benefit when it came to fuel consumption. The sole purpose of the carburetor was to maintain an air fuel ratio of 14.7 parts air to one part fuel throughout the full range of driving conditions whenever possible. This ratio had to be maintained because this is the ratio that allowed the catalytic converter to do its best possible job. It worked in conjunction with GM's computer command control system and the ECU which was the brain of it. The computer command control system contained several sensors with fed data to the ECU. This included a MAP sensor, coolant temperature sensor, and the throttle position sensor located inside the carburetor, amongst others. The ECU took the information from its sensors and determined what type of load the engine was under. It then factored in what the driver was trying to do with the throttle and determined how much fuel the engine would need to perform while keeping that ratio of air and fuel as close to 14.7 to 1 as it could. It used the oxygen sensor located in the exhaust manifold to see if it was doing its job. As the exhaust got richer or leaner, the voltage emanating from the sensor would change, giving the carburetor constant feedback on whether the changes it was making to the mixture were working or not. Hence the name, Feedback Carburetor. Now that we have a basic overview of the system, Let's talk about how the computer was actually able to make changes to the mixture as the engine was running. It did this through the mixture control solenoid that was located inside the carburetor itself. The solenoid was attached to a spring-loaded mechanism which would move the primary metering rods in and out of the jets. The ECU would pulse the rods up and down 10 times a second. It would maintain this 10 times a second pulse but would alter the speed at which it paused between in or out pulses. This resulted in the rods staying in the jets longer, leaning out the mixture, or being out of the jets longer, richening the mixture. In addition to the mixture control solenoid altering the amount of fuel passing through the jets, the dual jet and quadrajet feedback carburetors also had an air bleed valve located in the air horn which would follow the movements of the mixture control solenoid. This valve would alter the amount of air passing into a bleed circuit in the carburetor, giving the carburetor another way to help maintain that 14.7 to 1 ratio. 
The feedback carburetors provided a relatively seamless transition from the mechanical carburation for the average car buyer. Except for the addition of a check engine light on the dashboard, most drivers wouldn't even know that they were driving a car with an electronically controlled carburetor. You would still get in the car, pump the gas to set the choke, and turn the key to start it. The car would fast idle just like a mechanical carburetor, and then you would tap the gas to bring the idle down. There was no difference in drivability or acceleration for the end user. This assumed, however, that all things were working right. The carburetors usually worked fine from the factory. It's when the cars got a little older or needed some carburetor work that problems usually came up. The feedback carburetor had several new adjustment points and several new ways of calibrating things that some home mechanics and even some professional ones weren't aware of. All of the external systems operated the same. You had to set the float height, choke angle, and vacuum brakes as you normally did. It's when they were rebuilt or the idle mixture plugs were removed that things usually went wrong. First, during a rebuild, the mixture control solenoid travel needed to be set by using a special gauging tool along with the rich or lean stop screws. Many people didn't own this and either eyeballed it or tried to count the turns as they removed them. This almost always resulted in the travel being set incorrectly and the carburetor running too rich or lean while cruising, resulting in a check engine light. Most people didn't understand that this setting is probably the most critical thing to having these run properly. If the mixture control solenoid was set incorrectly, no amount of other adjustment would fix it. The next procedure that often tripped people up with these carburetors was the setting of the idle mixture screws. With a mechanical carburetor, you would most often use a vacuum gauge to get the setting right. However, with an electronic carburetor, you needed to attach a dwell meter to a special plug located under the hood. You would set it to the six cylinder scale and set the dwell to as close to 30 degrees as possible, factoring idle quality and smoothness. A lot of people neglected the meter and just sort of eyeballed it, creating problems down the road. The third setting that tripped people up on the quadrajet and dual jet was the idle air bleed valve. This also required a special gauging tool to get it close. There was a little room for adjustability and they were forgiving, but if they were grossly misadjusted, they would create problems. Overall, I happen to like the feedback carburetors and the results you will get with a well-tuned one. Granted, I've also spent years learning about them, collecting the special tools, and setting them up to run right. They're certainly no performers, but for your average daily driver, they work well. What do you guys think about GM's electronic feedback carburetors? Did you like them, or would you throw them out in favor of fuel injection? Let us know in the comments. Make sure you hit that subscribe button on the right side of your screen. Thanks for watching.